welcoming uh, all of you to this uh, wonderful panel today. The topic is uh, enhancing the user experience in online education through quality digital content and delivery. And I have a very eclectic, a huge uh, list of panelists with me today. I'm so fortunate to be listening to all of you. I'll just introduce quickly one by one. I have uh, Pajwal Sinha, co-founder, Amigos. Uh, we have Poonam Singh Jambal, director, uh, Extra Marks Education. India Private Limited, uh, Karanveer Singh, uh, founder and uh, MD uh, Pariksha. I have uh, with me Kush Bijal, uh, founder and CEO uh, Neo Stencil, uh, Udit Sahni, CEO uh, MyPath.in, Anuj Kumar, CTO Adda247, Arjun Mohan, uh, CEO India Upgrad. Uh, Gaurav Goyal, CEO, Top Rankers, Pulkit Jain, Co-Founder and Product Head, Vedantu, uh, Gomti Damodaran, Director, Aha Guru, Balaji Sampath, Founder, Aha Guru, uh, Ria Mehta, Product Manager, Digital Content, Lido, uh, Ahmad Nadeem, MD, uh, 13 Education, I3 Education, I3, I'm so sorry, I3 Education, my bad. Uh, Ashwin Rao, Sales Director, India, Limelight Networks, and will be joined by Charles, oh, he's here, Mr. Cross, uh, Senior Product Ma Marketing Manager, Limelight Networks. Uh, I welcome all of you to this uh, discussion today. And uh, as you know, e-learning has, uh, of course, it's always, always been important of, uh, for the education leaders and uh, the entire community, but in COVID, it has specifically uh, uh, got a, a certain prominence now. I think it has also enabled a seamless experience when the schools were closed, it was e-learning that came to the rescue. It's becoming mainstream and as we move forward, I think policy makers are taking a serious look at the future of e-learning. So this is broadly what we'll be discussing and we have all the thought leaders here. We have a certain uh, flow to this panel. I would be beginning, uh, we will begin with a, a, a short uh, keynote, I would call it, uh, by Mr. Charles Cross uh, of Limelight Networks. Uh, we would start with it and then we go to the questions. I welcome you, Mr. Cross, to start the, the, the discussion with your keynote. Okay, thank you. Good day, everyone. Let me just share my screen. It's still not. Sorry. So, uh, folks, while while Charles is is working with the the with Exchange for Media in terms of organizing the video, I just wanted to kind of break the awkward silence here <laughs> and, and, just, and just say hi to everyone. Um, hi. It's it's a it's a pleasure having you all. Um, you're obviously esteemed leaders in your own you know backyards. Um, Limelights. You know, just to give you a quick introduction, and Charles is going to talk a lot about it in detail. Um, you know, I would myself. I'm more of an eavesdropper on this call. Um, I'm the guy who's going to sit silently and kind of listen to all the industry feedback, the product feedback about how you guys are enabling your students, your your consumers, in terms of making the e-learning experience better. Um, and then you know we can we can open that up to the presentation. But I think Charles is ready right now. Um, so I just wanted to say hi, welcome everyone from my side as well, um, and I look forward to talking to all of you. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, I'm still getting the message. Host has disabled screen sharing. So. Uh, okay, so it's it's well. Can we start in the meantime? You know, with some points that you have while the tech guy sure. is starting. Yes. Sure. So I'm going to just put the screen in front of me and I'll just start talking and let me know when I can share. Oh, sure. So, yeah. So one of the things I want to talk about is every, every year, multiple times a year, Limelight does surveys of uh, consumers about their habits with watching video and uh, generally digital lifestyles. And this spring, we decided to make a change in, in what we do. So we took the survey and we made it about the pandemic and about the new habits. And, and we discovered a lot of interesting things about the different types of uses of video, the big increases in, in demand, certainly for online education. And I'm gonna use a, a sort of a broad definition of, of online learning. It's, it's not just schools and universities, but it, it's extended to many, many different activities that uh, 
people use. Certainly a, a massive switch to working at home and, and learning has, has involved now such things as workout classes, people learning to play a musical instrument or, or improving their hobbies and so forth. Mm. So um, I, I, we haven't released the survey publicly, not for another week, but I was allowed to share just some data on uh, specific to India that I'll share. And it's it just sort of a little bit of a teaser so that when the full report comes out, you want to read it. But um, India, India is, is always an outlier when we do these 10 country surveys. So we survey countries in, in Asia Pacific, uh, North and South America, Europe, and so forth. And people in India tend to use video more than people in any other countries. So for example, um, just video-based platforms. So 87% of the consumers that we surveyed in India said that they expect a big increase in the use of video platforms, not only now, but even after the pandemic abates that they'll continue, uh, continue to do that. Um, Ninety-three percent of them uh, are actually already using um, learning, learning of all sorts, uh, taking the language class, musical instrument, uh, school children. So that's you know that's practically everybody in the population, and things like online fitness. Um, Eighty-two percent of people who who generally take either exercise classes and maybe go to a gym now are doing that online. So before we uh, go further, I, what I want to do is talk about a couple of case studies uh, for, from countries in India. So one is, one is an e-learning company, Topper. Uh, they're based in Mumbai, and they offer uh, a comprehensive after-school learning pr program for you know, K through 12 students. So they currently have two and a half million student users who are using uh, their platform for taking exams and learning. And so the challenges they have were, one is they had a rapid growth to get to two and a half million students, and they have a total of 8,000 video classes uh, in, their, in their library. And they want to improve the user experience. So users use any kind of device, mobile devices, tablets, PCs, and they want to make sure they can have a great user experience on all of them. And they want to deliver videos as fast as possible. So when someone goes online and requests a video, it's delivered quickly. So the solution they used is they're using Limelight's content delivery service. So this is the, this is the basic CDN service to deliver content from any source to any place in the world. And also something that the CDN has is storage. So the 8,000 different lesson videos are stored in CDN uh, storage. And, and the reason they do that is for very fast access. So when somebody requests a video, the request doesn't have to go to the topper platform. It, it, it's delivered directly out of the CDN. And so, so you can show the screen now. I can share the screen? Oh, that's yeah. great. Let me try that. Beautiful. OK, now does everybody see the screen? Yes. yes. Okay. So, so the uh, the benefits for. In fact, let me put it into slideshow mode. Make it there we go. So the results that they have is now they're now they're able to upload, store, and deliver these eight thousand videos without any rebuffering. Uh, they come up fast because they're stored in Origin Storage and they have very responsive customer support. So we have 24 by seven, 365 help. Uh, another one, this is not in India. This is a French company, Coach Guitar. Coach, Coach, Guitar. Coach Guitar. So a different type of different type of use. Uh, now we're getting a feedback. Uh, no, it's fine, it's fine. You can start now. It's okay? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, okay. So this is music lessons, again, another popular thing that's come up. So this is learning to play guitar online. And again, they had similar growth problems. Suddenly, you know, 40,000 downloads per day. Uh, they're expanding into new markets, and they need storage for the library. So pretty similar. They're using content delivery and storage. And again, now they have very good user experience. The videos come up fast, you know, lots of good technical support. So it's 
you know, two good examples of, of a type of e-learning that's going on. So what we've seen, you know, of the impact of this is one thing is prime time has shifted. The, the times people watch video and use it is different from prime time before. It can be during, during the day. Uh, Mr. Cross, I just want to interrupt just a little uh, yep. thing with the audio. It's a little bit of fear. Is it okay now? Yes, sounds better. Yeah. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah, so it's feedback loop. So one of the things happened is traffic patterns have changed and it's unpredictable. So as a, as a, as a global network, we're seeing um, very new behaviors and demands around the world in different regions for when people want to watch video. And, and generally the, the, the total amount has increased you know, almost 50% around the world, everywhere. So so far, Global Networks is doing a good job oh, sorry, to bring sorry, all sorry. this. I am really sorry to interrupt again. Can I request everyone to mute their microphones? I think that is the reason. Then only we would be able to hear, you know, Mr. Cross well. Everyone yeah, can... yeah, that's a good point. Yes, yeah. Yes, it, yes. If you want to ask questions, you can unmute. But if everybody yes. mutes... Yes, oh. yes. I think that is the take. Yes, sir. Please Perfect. can continue. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so... Um, And also, sometimes there's been demands for reducing the streaming bit rates to, you know, take the load off the networks and, and make sure that, um, you know, there's, there's some capacity there in case there's like emergency news updates and so forth. So that's, that's been a challenge for some of the networks to adapt to all this. So just a little bit about Limelight, you know, what we do, it's basically four basic businesses. It's, it's the biggest is on-demand and live video majority of the traffic and our revenue comes from video. In fact, we're, we're, we're really known as the video CDN because we've built a network that's optimized for this. But also, there's a good business in software file downloads. So if you think about devices and the big software updates for like an iPhone, or, or one of the big things now is, is big video games that, that people play online, that's become a, a big means of distraction for people. The file sizes of these have growing to almost be 200 gigabytes now. And when lots of people want to download those, that's a, that's a big strain. And then web content for the objects on a website and then things, something new is edge compute. So the ability to have customized edge, edge compute resources for you to use. So why are we different? There's a lot of CDNs. One is we, we have a global private network. We do not use the internet like most CDNs do, we, we have private fiber. So this enables us to have control over how we route traffic. So for video, we have a quality of service enabled network. So we route our traffic through high priority queues and, and around congestion points. And uh, all our servers are a big powerful new servers, with, uh, all solid state drives, which is important for video, so it's fast and uh, lots of capacities. So we handle 4K and we know 8K videos coming, you know, soon next, mostly next year. So, you know, some of the challenges we have is, you know, how do you add capacity? So there's several ways to do it. One is increase the number of pops to cover more locations. Another is increase the number of links to connect them and also add capacity at each pop. And then being intelligently utilizing the infrastructure. So things like dynamic load balancing, um, to add redundancy, so we use multiple paths. Uh, we, we use what we call cap checks. When we do big live events, we, we make sure we have paths with a lot of bandwidth linked up and ready to go so we can take really high demands on this. We can serve streams from multiple regions so we spread the load out. And the most important thing is network engineers in the, in the network operating center are, are there for every live event managing the traffic, looking at, looking at the network, and doing any engineering they need to do during the whole event to make sure it's running properly. So I just want to show a few typical workflows. This is the main on-demand and live workflow. So whether, whether you're doing a live or on-demand, it's very simple. We, we just ingest either RTMP or MP, MP4 streams from the content owners. We do everything we everything automatic in the network in terms of transcoding, transmuxing to get them to the correct format for any device. 
this is this is working with device detection so whether you have a tablet or a laptop or a pc or a game console any anything you're watching video on we from the requests we know exactly what the device is what format the video has to be in we know about the screen size so all this formatting uh, is it hls is it dash and what the screen resolution is is all taken care of automatically and that's a typical workflow uh, the other is some of the very large uh, companies like Amazon or Hulu, the, these very big Netflix, they do their own transcoding and transmuxing and they just deliver packaged video to us for distribution. And this is the content delivery. So we don't, we bypass the transcoding and transmuxing in the CDN and we just basically use our network to deliver to their audience anywhere in the world and they, they wanna do the transcoding themselves. So for on-demand, I'll just build this slide out. So typically you'll bring MP4 in at a high bit rate. And what we'll do is we'll transcode that down to the different bit rates that you need for 1080p or 720. And then in the CDN delivery, depending on the request. So you may have a, you may have a laptop requesting a four meg dash stream and we'll send that could be a streaming device like a Roku that wants 720p, 2.4 meg. So depending on the device, what the bandwidth is that they want and what the format is, all that will be taken care of by the CDN. Sorry, your voice is... Uh, so your Charles, voice you're is fading is away. Yeah, yeah. My voice is fading away. Maybe yeah, now, it's talk. Fine. now it's fine. Is that better if I talk louder? Okay. Okay. So, just the same thing again with packaging. So um, we, we accept the videos from the server, the, the origin server. We do, we do the packaging and then we deliver out. For live traffic, it's a very similar workflow, except now we're receiving RTMP source. So that's streamed to us. We transcode it to the different bit rates that the devices require. And then the CDN delivers the proper bit rate from the device detection out to each. So the very simple workflows, they, they, they take these complex tasks and, and offload that you know, into, into functionality in the, net, in the CDN network to make it easier for content owners to distribute their video. Um, I always have to talk about security when you're talking about video. So a lot of times if you license content, be, you need to protect it against theft. So you have digital rights management or DRM, and that's part of it. Um, you access control. So uh, sometimes you want to control by region who can receive it. Some licensed traffic may have rights that, that restrict the regions that can receive it. So you use geolocation based on the IP address to control that. Um, things like, um, HTTPS, so globally, so you can you encrypt the video traffic when you send it. And then just on the infrastructure, you wanna have DDoS attack protection and, and web application firewall protection so that the website's always available. So all of these services we're talking about are all part of what's in the CDN that, are, that, that can be used when you deliver video. For web application firewall, this is, this is very critical. Where DDoS attack are, are trying to shut down access to the network, WAP attacks are going after uh, like personal data, either either to, to steal consumers' private information, credit card numbers, things like that. Um, and so you need to have protection against that. And these are these are combined with with bot management, so you know good bots and bad bots. So the idea is. Uh, is, is detection nodes through the network to detect and block these attacks fast so that uh, there's no attacks, but to do, it, to do it in a way that does not impact performance. So we have a way of uh, looking at the traffic without impacting the performance by having a lot of detection nodes in the network. Uh, and you wanna do protection across all channels. So it's not just the websites, but you wanna protect mobile applications and you wanna protect API. So these services are working across all these channels. Uh, bot detection, you know, there's good bots and bad bots. We all know that the internet wouldn't work without good bots to do the, the searching and scanning and finding out how to locate content. 
uh, you know, Google, Google does this all the time so that it can make an index of where everything is located for you, and those are all good bots. You use it to, to look to measure performance of your network and how your website's operating, but there's also bad bots that are getting very sophisticated. They, they can detect, and they're very human-like in the way they spoof mouse movements and so forth, so they're harder to detect. And they're the ones that are trying to get in to steal private data and so forth or, you know, and involve money transfers and try to, you know, do that kind of theft. So uh, the, the, the bot detection capabilities really have to include what we call this, these new fourth generation human-like bots and detect them. So all of these services are available in the security suite that we have. And just briefly, just, you know, quickly, some, some customers I try to put up customers from around the world that are that are well known and they they've heard of. Uh, so sorry your voice is wanna... fading away sorry yeah excuse me your voice is a little fading away again sorry oh feeding in okay well this is this is the last slide now i didn't i just wanted i didn't want to take too much time going through this i want to get to the important stuff which is the discussions of, of the topic of the day so i'm going to stop sharing so we can all we can get back on the Screen here. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you, you sir. Thank you for this wonderful. On any of that? Uh, yeah, this has been a good uh, discussion for you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for uh, this presentation. And we'll just get into a discussion now. I'll start. Sure. Uh, uh, I will start uh, with you, uh, uh, Kush. Uh, can I? I'll just yes. So, so we are talking about the impact of COVID and on e-learning, and and much has been already spoken about it. You know that it has it has made the new normal, main new uh, mainstream. But from your personal experience, as you have observed, what has been the large uh, you know takeaway for e-learning players from the COVID? Sure. So, uh, I mean, uh, we have seen students, you know, uh, having the more number. Of is coming in for online course that is definitely there and it's not only just students but you know all the content providers whether it's individual teachers or you know test prep institutions or colleges or schools so so it's, it's just like you know the both ends of the uh, periphery that is you know supply, uh, the content providers and the content consumers both i mean both of them are now looking to go online you know, some of the other way. And this is, this is the, this is a fast changing environment wherein everybody is looking to consume and, you know, get on with it as soon as possible. Uh, on the supplier side, it, it has become a necessity now because if they don't go online, the other player will go online and then they're going to lose out, uh, you know, to their competitors. So right. that's something that is, you know, that, that has become a new, new normal as we all understand. And uh, of course, with all these things, you know, a lot more content is going to be created online. And when a lot more content is created, the problem of plenty occurs. So, so that's somewhere, you know, the curation is going to matter, you know, in the future, uh, of course. And on the, on the supplier side, uh, the teachers and the institutions will now be teaching online for the first time. So there, of course, is going to be a training, you know, they might have to undergo or they will, you know, they will improve over the time. So those are the few, you know, initial challenges that the suppliers, the content providers are going to face initially. Uh, on the student side, I'm sure Limelight is doing a great work and, you know, in terms of you know, optimizing the bandwidth at their end because uh, until the time the, inf uh, the internet infrastructure is great, you know, we do need, the industry do need solutions like Limelight wherein, you know, bandwidth is not an issue while consuming uh, the content. Right. Uh, Udit, if I have to ask you the same question, what would you say? Uh, first of all, I think uh, obviously the new normal has shifted. Uh, if I look back, the initial period of say March and, and April, all of us were fighting for one thing, to bring all the classes online. One thing has uh, been defined, recorded videos over live sessions, this debate. So live sessions by live tutors has clearly been the winner. Uh, because, you know, uh, education is a very different kind of an animal. It, too much depends upon the grade of student which you are teaching to. So maybe senior students can see videos and can learn the guitar lessons and all of that. However, uh, children going to schools, uh, you have to have a teacher hand holding the students. So the recorded lessons practically will be helpful 
only uh, I, if I can see as a student the recording of the session I attended to. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I think uh, all the online companies, they cracked the code of how to teach online. So I think now everyone are into the same well. Uh, we have passed that phase. But now what remains is the real experience. Um, see, there are two aspects of it. One is technological aspect. One is academic aspect. Uh, when we talk about technology, I think uh, the speed, the experience, uh, the seamlessness, and all of this comes together. And you know, so for example, now we are having our admission tests online. We are counseling online. We are delivering the courseware online, including the live classes. We're having the assessments online. You know, all of that has suddenly come up. But there is, a, I think, uh, what the larger thing I always miss in uh, all these discussions around education is the core focus on academics. That is not changing. For example, I can give you three quick examples of how online classes are not as good as the classroom. Though I'm an online player, but I'm still saying this because then I will give the solutions as well. Right. You see, we all have seen our children in our home getting tutored uh, online with the help of various tools, different tools with their school teachers. But what we observed also was all of their videos were off. They were put to mute so that the, they cannot create ruckus in the classroom. So how do students lose that out? I've also seen a lot of students now move away from the screens because teacher cannot watch them. So that's the problem to solve. And obviously that's a bandwidth issue. The second thing is their mics were also put to off. So now you have to understand uh, the way education is designed, the curricula. Mm -hmm. It is always dependent upon, so these are different nodes. One is dependent on the other. So unless a student can raise their hand in the classroom and ask a question, he is not going to understand the real depth of it. You know, the other thing I would say uh, is missing greatly, which can never probably happen unless we really bring down the student to teacher ratio is the respect that a teacher could command in the classroom. So a lot of students also study, they do well because there was social pressure because, you know, I was, uh, I hated chemistry in my school time, but uh, I was studying chemistry just so hard only because my chemistry teacher was my best teacher. She just had so much confidence in me. So all of that gets missing because, you know, then a teacher at a distance who I do not connect to personally, I do not revere that. So in our Indian, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, system, we revere our gurus, right. right? So that goes missing. And the last thing is, the efficacy of the peer group. So we are currently catering to say J uh, market, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th. So, uh, and we create, end up creating a lot of top rankers in India. What right. we also heard from them is their peer group is extremely, extremely important to them. Extremely important for the kind of uh, competition that positive competition that it creates. So now if I'm not connecting to, connected to my students, my fellow students, that also goes missing. So all of these are negative parts of uh, learning online. However, the first principle remains the same. And I think we should all focus on that. And what is that? We have to really understand to crack this. We have to understand how a student consumes knowledge, consumes information, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we have to have goal setting sessions for them. You have to have uh, a student bring up in a way wherein he's able to identify a goal for himself. Then we have to personalize his path. Right. And that cannot happen without analytics. Right. So, so I, I'll come to it. I'll come to it. Sorry. This, this time I'll, I'll come to it. I have a separate question on it. I, yeah. I, I right now want to go to uh, Poonam Singh and ask her that how much do you agree with what uh, Udit has said, you know, mm. virtual gurus. I mean, we have, do we uh, kind of, can we recreate the same atmosphere that, uh, the school gives us. I mean, what what are your learnings from the from the COVID experience? Uh, so hi everybody. Uh, I would first, before starting, would like to tell you that uh, we've been uh, serving the K twelve market for the last fifteen years, and uh, we have we we have nine million students already studying online with us. Around the six million in the schools, and uh, there was a 
a lot of adoption and a lot of learning from us in the process of serving that uh, population. As a result, when we came, uh, we were hit by COVID, our response was sharper and, and, and uh, we knew what to expect in terms of serving the audience. We realized the one single common factor that made the whole process seamless was the uh, quality learning content that they were already consuming. And, right. and they, they, they just seamlessly access the same content online through the app, apps and from the teaching platform. So, so the, uh, the main topic of today's discussion really, which is uh, the new learning that all of us in the COVID environment have to realize, uh, is, is that the learning content is going to be the core of everything and will also bring value to the teacher and also will bring value to the child. How we consume uh, digital learning resources is what is going to change. I'll give you an example. Right. When we are in the classroom, the teacher is using digital learning content uh, through the smart class solution, right? And, and, and within that, it is not a, anymore a just an entertainment product. It, it is to do with uh, leveraging the best technologies and experience, 2D, 3D, AI, etc. that she knows that she's created a hierarchy of learning. You know, one is to get uh, just uh, a video and share with the child. Other is to embed it with pedagogy. And she is using that in the classroom. And the student is familiar with her using that in the classroom. Now, moment she moves online, in an online classroom, she is using the similar tools to reach out to the child. And there is, it is embedded with the basic principles of how a child learns. So he can learn it through uh, animation, uh, uh, lecture by the teacher, or he can uh, learn from flow charts. All those solutions are available to the child. What is now going to change? One is most, even in a smart class environment, it was instruction-led model. But, but when you go online, the fatigue of an instruction-led model sets in. When you have 40 tiles of students, you can't pay attention to any child. Then how do you give personalized attention to the child? Then within the teaching platform, other than embedding the, all the learning solutions on. Can we go yeah. to Karanveer with the same question that, you know, what have been your learnings uh, from the COVID? And as others have pointed out, you know, they have said that there are certain things which cannot be recreated and we need to fill those gaps. What are your views on that? Yes, I can. I'm sorry. My microphone was on, on mute. No, no, sorry, sorry. So thank you. Thank you for having me here. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Karan Singh. Uh, I am the founder of Pariksha. So we cater to a very, very different market. Uh, Pariksha is primarily meant for Bharat. Uh, we are vernacular in nature and today we serve over two and a half million users across uh, 11 states and six languages. What we have experienced is that generally, uh, if you look at Bharat population and if you look at the students as well as the education institutions there, most of them, they are run by the traditional mindsets. Uh, whether it is students or whether it is teachers, they were earlier averse to adopting technology. But suddenly what has happened is because of the COVID, uh, you know, all the schools, coaching institutes, everything is shut. And uh, whether it is the coaching institute owners or whether it is, uh, when I mean, what I mean by coaching institute owners is, uh, for, it is for Charles. So Charles, we have private tutors here in India who will help you mm -hmm. prepare for, um, for these exams. So whether it is these educational institutions or whether it is the, uh, the student, suddenly they were forced to adopt technology. And once they were forced to adopt technology, they realized that a better or maybe at par experience can be delivered with the help of technology. So the kind of experience Udit was talking about, probably this is more prevalent in, in the urban India where you have a student teacher ratio. But if you look at the rural India, which is Bharat, there is no concept of student teacher ratio there. In one class, you'll find 500 people sitting there. There are no desks, only chairs. Uh, you know, you have to keep your notebook on your lap and you keep taking down notes. In 500 students, uh, I, I doubt anybody can have the courage to raise their hand and say, you know, I did not understand this. So that kind of interactive was missing there. What we have experienced is that suddenly, because technology also offers you this anonymity, uh, you know, you can be anywhere. Nobody's going to laugh at you. You can still raise your hand and you can ask a question. So we have seen uh, people hooking onto the platform now. Uh, 
and the education institutions also realizing that a much better experience or at par experience can be delivered at maybe one fourth or one fifth of the price. Yes. Uh, was I the only one who stepped out? Uh, we we lost uh, the connection in between, but I will. So so I started yes with the next question, but I'll come back to you. I'll come. Back. Okay. Okay. All right. Yes. So yes, our please. learning, uh, Rohit, uh, 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 Rohit, our learning has been very very different. Uh, um, our learning is um, uh, is very positive in the sense that uh, the entire landscape, whether it is the students or whether it is the teachers uh, or the uh, education institutions, all of them are openly adopting technology now. Right, right. Uh, I want to come to you, uh, Anuj. Uh, you know, um, yes, uh, Anuj. I want to come to you. Uh, okay, I thought I'll just complete my thought because it got stuck. Uh, okay, 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 okay. So, so I just wanted to just conclude with the thing that the 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 connecting factor would be a learning content really, and now we have to start looking at learning content as a self-learning uh, tool uh, instead of the school books because school books are actually going to get redundant and uh, the learning content would be in terms of digital solutions etc that the child learns himself and uses the teacher interaction more like a tutorial rather than an instru instruction model and then for that i think it's very critical for the content quality to be a plus and for it to leverage best technologies and be accessed by the best technology, uh, you know, all the platforms. It should be platform agnostic, hardware agnostic for a good experience to be there. Right. Yeah. I think one quick learning in 40 minutes that I have is that we need great connectivity and delivery mechanisms as well. Yeah, yeah, case, yeah. You know? <laughs> Very critical part of this. 100 great content, yes. Uh, I want to come to you, Anuj, and uh, ask you that. Uh, uh, E-learning, when it comes to e-learning, do you think this search was unexpected and how did you meet the demand? There was no time to think around, you know, it was like so quick a strategy needed. How did you adjust to it and, and kind of, you know, uh, brought out the content and, you know, reached out to all the people? Yeah. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, uh, so I'm representing Adda here. So uh, I think very great question here. So uh, for technology actually, and I think at this particular time, what happened is that we saw everybody saw that surge and, and kind of uh, a number of people who are coming online and getting the education or looking for the education content, right? So, uh, so I think important part is that for the technology, everything needs to be ready, right? You cannot think of that someday you would be like getting the traffic and then you'll be preparing yourself for like this this kind of a situation, right? So adoption of technology is inevitable, right? And everybody has to actually accept it or let's suppose get it uh, as soon as, or it could be like pushed to them as well. So this pandemic has pushed it to, to the people, right? But if you'll talk about the online digital uh, players, they have to be kind of ready uh, with, the, with the scalability, with the technology platforms, uh, all, all the plat all the infrastructure, which, which could actually cater to this kind of a situation. So I, I would say that, being ready is the very important part to actually uh, uh, overcome problems which you could see th at this kind of a situation. Right. Yeah, that is a reason within a month, surprisingly, we could onboard 2 million children within a month. Right. And if, if that readiness wasn't there, scalability wouldn't have been possible. So that's Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. I want to go to Arjun uh, with the same question that, you know, there was little uh, time to strategize and adjust and all of that. And yet, you know, e-learning has become so effective, such a great alternative. What have been your learnings at Upgrad, if you could tell us? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I moved from K-12 into higher ed, bang in the middle of the uh, lockdown. So I joined Upgrad on 1st April wow. and I've been working from home ever since then. Yeah, what's been interesting, um, I mean, I'm sure that none of us, I mean, we have been facing a lot of challenges throughout our life, especially in the last five, 10 years, you had demonetization, you had the whole NBFC crisis, every time the market gets affected, some of the other things, but this has been, I would say, unprecedented. So many changes, not only on the demand side, but also on the supply side. Like nobody knew what will happen. Every day is a new one. So first and foremost thing is that, see, typically, how do you solve a problem? You solve a problem by looking at the data, right? You look at what, is, what happened past year this time. You look at what happened past quarter this time. Problem today is there is no history to check. 
every day is me so the only thing you can do is what is happening now what happened to us ago how is the consumer behavior changing so that's the first and foremost thing it's been only about now what is the consumer doing so very simple you keep the consumer at the center of your universe your product your strategy your delivery your marketing everything should be around that person on what is current needs is what is fears are what is aspiration are so on and so forth so right. i mean i don't need to tell this but every edtech company in the country may it be k12 uh, higher ed whatever it is saw a 5 to 6 foot uh, times growth in traffic everywhere and everyone knew this was an opportunity a lot of fencers were there who never really believed in online it was an opportunity to really show them people who had confidence in their product they have told that okay fine why don't you check out my product for free because i have the confidence that you would love the product and then you will come on board today or some day at least i have given you to see so this is what i literally everyone did somebody who had a good product was able to retain others we are seeing what is happening today so what a typically has been happening and i'm not speaking for upgrade alone i'm speaking for a complete uh, at okay. five to six times the uh, the top of the funnel has gone up up a funnel I mean, like the traffic has gone up but the revenue is where the problem is right finally all of us survive on that on that revenue part so for there what i what i have observed and uh, this is what most of the people have told me also is that the customer sales cycle the time taken by a customer to make a decision has really gone down the customer is still thinking okay should i do it this is uncertain i don't know what will happen to my job so on and so forth so the organizations where i am seeing who is really completing the loop are the ones who is just not able to take advantage of that traffic but also having the right infrastructure and products to bring that conversion so like the way uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, udit said for his market his realization has been that that needle mover is a live club Sorry. in case of in case of my market i have been very clear that i will give these things uh, and ensure that the people are engaged see whatever said and done education is a business if i can use it which always works when people are doing well they are ambitious they want to do more and go up in life when they are in trouble they are looking at education to protect themselves from the issue which will come so it has been completely about how well you have been able to sales do your sales and market it out to them by understanding their competent or their fears in their mind so it has helped a lot that a uh, well trained sales team a sales team which was able to rigorously push forward on a marketing marketing uh, i mean the marketing muscle which never got uh, able to pivot out and change things they soon all those things are really up so my guess is that on the other side of the pandemic also i don't really see edtech emerging out as every company in edtech emerging out i would say that only few companies who had the right product the right marketing and the right sales team to come out successful but it's uh, it's been it's been pretty interesting and i like i think uh, the same was being told by karan right his market is very different he found he and he was having a sort of a problem which he was solving so i mean in my understanding in last two and a half months what i have understood is that you just keep the customer at the center of your universe perfect, perfect. if you are able to make decision after listening to him that's all that matters <laughs> right gorov i want to come to you with this one of the points that do you think uh, i mean the feeling among the you know ad tech uh, ad tech players is that you know we were ahead of the time and you know they have the satisfaction right now that look we always felt like that you know is that that feeling also there apart from the learnings that i want to know what are the big time <laughs> yeah so if i can kind of place it this way so i think this pandemic has more emerged like a a lead magnet which is like you're getting lot of leads in and like if you a few see the two journeys of a candidate a pre purchase journey and a post purchase journey so now you and as a company you have to really focus on both of them mm-hmm. so i think it has really helped in a pre purchase journey where you have a lead magnet now and the second step generally is like you have a trip wire where you want to you want a student to make a small transaction with you and i i think as uh, arjun rightly mentioned that yes there is the different people are facing different stuff for some there is a better conversions for some the conversions are not still good and i think uh, one very good realization which has happened is i think if this kind of a trap traffic is coming in what you can do with the post purchase journey so 
the, because education is not a referral market. Like if you see all large brick and mortar businesses, like all coaching centers, because we have a very different mod business model. We are an online coaching marketplace. We work with about 1000 plus institutes. We have about 4.2 million students on the platform. Mm -hmm. So we largely get all our learnings from offline institutes. We work with them and try to transform everything online, whatever they are doing. Uh, like uh, one of the things which has really worked well for us and we, we have kind of uh, really taken six, seven folds uh, into that side is adding a secondary teacher as part of a class. Exactly. So we had a primary teacher who's teaching, which is a star teacher generally, and everybody wants to get taught from them. Now what happens? So you can do personalization in two ways. Either your tech can do it, or you can do it through a secondary teacher. We have taken a secondary teacher approach because tech is still evolving. You are still learning what has to get personalized because there are a lot of exams. We serve right now about 150 exams. So, and a lot of things works, work very differently for each of those. Right. So I think, yeah, so I think, um, a massive shit, a good lead magnet. Uh, we have like, we are now consuming about 400 terabytes of data monthly. Um, millions of users are coming in. Uh, yeah, but I think it's time now to work on a post purchase journey. And I think right. that will take all of us ahead. Right. Uh, Balaji, uh, I want to come to you with the next question. I mean, the question is the same. The same. Uh, I want to understand from you, basically, the key learnings uh, for, for your company, uh, Aha Guru from this pandemic? What were the key takeaways for you? See, I think uh, uh, probably going with what Gaurav was saying, the post-purchase journey is basically what we had been uh, focusing a lot on. Mm -hmm. I mean, we decided not to go in for a, a drawing in the free thing because I know that everybody is uh, doing that also. So we decided that we won't be offering too many of these free uh, things to lure people in. Rather focus on the sales part directly because then you're talking about students who are serious about taking the course. Because otherwise, a lot of people are also in the exploratory mode. In fact, one of the things that I'm worried about, I mean, probably a little bit of a twist from the general, uh, 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 there, is, there is a sense that uh, online has now become a mainstream uh, way of thinking. Uh, but there is also a small danger that too many people who are not ready for online have jumped into online in a big way. I mean, for example, there is Zoom tiredness that has happened across in schools. And there is going to be a reaction to this. There are going to be two kinds of reaction. There's going to be one official reaction that you see, for example, from Karnataka, where they keep saying that you're going to shut down online. Two, three rounds, this has gone back and forth. And so there is going to be people coming and saying that this does not work. A lot of people who look at a bad teacher in classroom, the school parents are not seeing it. Now you see the same bad teacher performing online worse than usual. So Zoom enabled bad teaching uh, uh, basically is getting promoted in a big way, let's say. Now, when something like this happens, what parents realize or come to a very quick conclusion may not be the right conclusion, but they come to a conclusion saying online does not work. But they don't necessarily come to a conclusion saying bad teachers are there in my school. They come to a conclusion that this methodology that you are now using or you're seeing is the problem. They never saw the bad teacher working in school either before. But what people come to a conclusion depends on what they see. So there is going to be, I mean, I, I expect and I think everybody should start to expect there is going to be a huge backlash that is going to come while the current phase where there was such a lot of adoption, there is also going to be a backlash where many people who might have become customers will go back saying oh, no, online does not work. In fact, we have seen this earlier. Uh, for example, when a company comes in and does a lot of edutainment and serious learners suddenly come back and uh, say, no, no, I don't want that type of animation based and just too much of games. Uh, I want serious learning, right? So that right. backlash you have seen already with the education market. Many times education market has gone through phases. Uh, sometimes there has been a company which has gone in in a big way like Educomp did uh, uh, going into schools. For a while, schools would come back and say, no, uh, technology does not work in education. So right. we have to be very careful about the backlash that is a huge uh, thing that is brewing right now. I mean, right. while on one side, there is a growth of uh, usage of online and so on, and there is demonstration. We have to recognize that many people who have gone online are not people who have done enough work on online. They don't know how to teach online. They're looking up there when they're talking. So you can see the teachers, uh, the video is not even clear. The teacher is not even talking to that person. So many times, all of this is creating a lot of issue. There is also uh, very bad bandwidth uh, in certain cases. So for example, uh, while there is one advantage of the live kind of session, there's also the problem that when you go back and forth on the live session and that sometimes gets cut, 
how people perceive this and therefore their conclusion afterwards is that maybe this won't work i'm not saying that it will be true for all the people hopefully many more people who have got uh, shifted or have had to try online will stick with it but i also think that there will be many people who might have gone online if they had done it little bit more slowly with a little better preparation with a better product now maybe they have basically kind of hate the experience so much that they won't even try so that is something that one needs to seriously yeah. look at another problem that has happened because there are so many free uh, things available people who might have wanted to purchase are now doing this shopping experience so they are saying okay let me try this free or oh, this does not work let me try that free that does not work let me try that free so therefore that uh, uh, element of uh, shopping around to see what is going to work before settling down i think that uh, also something that we must look at so right. it is slightly more complex than a always complete 100% positive direction and uh, partly depends on how fast or how quickly are they able to see good uh, online experiences because what i do find is once they see a good online experience then they are willing to get converted but if they don't see a good online experience online too much online exposure before they manage to see good online ex experience can also spoil the market like sometimes in a marketplace if let us say there were three good products but there are 100 bad products by the time the user search the first uh, 10 products they have got tired they say all products are bad right. they never got to the three good products so that is something that we need to be wary of it okay. is important to promote and focus on the good online products because then the whole online space itself grows so okay. there I'm I'm sorry for all of those who are waiting. I mean I'm sorry I have to go through a little bit of patience is needed. I'll come to you, uh, Pulkit, uh, with the same uh, question. You know, uh, just a quick uh, takeaways for your company. You know? I'll come to others who are just waiting. I have just following a quick, uh, you know, go, going through everyone quickly and just just coming. So hi, uh, uh, thanks for having me and you know, uh, with such an esteemed panel here, uh, a lot of learnings. so i think the the points are almost the same which everyone has covered uh, so i have been in this journey for quite some time now uh, almost 15 years uh, from offline institution to online we have been doing live online for since 2014 so good to see that you know uh, it's becoming a norm now what we used to you know it, it it used to be a struggle to tell everyone in the ecosystem as well as parents that this is a a, a, a valid and effective way of learning but yeah having said that you know in my mind uh, this covid definitely has short circuited a lot of stuff but education is a big deep problem and i think all of us together in at tech we need to do a lot of hard work to solve it uh, in a way that we can provide predictable learning experiences at scale so what i've learned is you know doing things at a boutique uh, uh, level where you know Uh, the scale is less is easier but if you want to do things at a massive scale keeping predictability mm -hmm. of learning outcomes which are mathematically measurable right, right. uh act is a tremendously challenging and tough problem which all of us are together in so i think a lot of innovations from all sides will emerge very fast now um so right. that's that's Perfect. what we, are, we all are looking forward to yeah gomti can you hear me uh, some quick thoughts from you yeah so i can hear um thanks i think uh, what uh, balaji uh, said actually covered it so we uh, do see lot of uh, children uh, coming up here and uh, like they wanted to actually explore but uh, particularly like children from rural areas they actually find it very difficult and they want to uh, get good uh, they don't want to miss out at the same time at the same time they want to learn something so we had to be very clear it's not if we should not be in a rush to actually offer them solutions because because uh, most of the time that will also uh, backfire uh, our product of this thing because they may not be ready to ex actually consume the product right. so uh, aha guru has been like very clear on like if 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 we feel like uh, for this particular section of children it is not going to help them out so we tell them okay it is not going to help you out and it should not because lot of times what happens is uh, in schools and other places they try to uh, actually like take something out and like give it to the students in a hurry which is actually not a good thing because finally they end up getting a very bad learning experience um right. so we have actually conducted a um, 
uh, free sessions for uh, school children so that actually uh, like uh, really like lot of children like the uh, courses and all but that was completely like we have done for almost 40 to 50 schools but uh, still uh, we were very uh, particular uh, to do it in the uh, tier 1 and tier 2 cities and we have not explored to tier 3 because we are not very clear whether that content will be suitable for those students so when as an edtech player we should be clear because our product may not be suitable for all the uh, students right right uh, prajwal if i come to you with the same question a quick thought Uh, see, what I believe is that oh, what we have recently seen is that um, you know reaching out to different people, different sector has become easier because of uh, you know the online education. Uh, while uh, you know right now somebody is sitting in a small village can actually go ahead and watch videos uh, you know by Vedantu, by uh, a grad, uh, you know my pad. So we have been able to reach out to uh, you know the depths of India, but then obviously you know and and a lot of credit goes to the internet access that we have got. Probably uh, India was made ready by uh, Geo about two three years ago, and and you know, uh, for example, Limelight specializes in content delivery networks where the access has to be really good, right? Okay. So that they are able to view the videos very uh, properly, right? That's a very important uh, point here. I, this is a separate but, question I have on that yes, completely. Yes. But uh, what we have also seen is that though the uh, you know the main education will not be uh, you know right now we are we are in a phase. I think this is going to go back to. Uh, to an extent, uh, uh, the way it was before, at least, but definitely this is going to take some time, probably till February. But you know, uh, when when it comes to upskilling or preparing for competitive examinations, they, uh, you know, that's where uh, you know uh, online education will uh, continue, and people will be able to you know uh, adapt uh, adopt this a, a lot better than earlier. Because right. now they have been they have gotten used to this. Right. Uh, this is my take on. Uh, right. Uh, Ria and then Mr. Uh, Ahmed, I want to come to you. Ria, I want to come to you first, your quick thoughts, and then I go to Mr. Ahmed. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, so, I, I mean, just I think everyone's kind of covered a lot of what the universal challenges would have been. Um, I think in our case, you know, the advantage that we have in the ed tech space in general is, in a way, um, we are a solution uh, to the COVID environment, right? Like you your students can't go to school, like your students can't go to offline tuitions anymore, like we have a ready to go solution, right? And I think with Lido, because we are a younger company, um, I think our challenges were a bit unique, um, mostly because there were a lot of things on our roadmap that we had to kind of just put the, like push the pedal on as soon as we went into lockdown. Um, so some of the challenges we faced with were sort of with device compatibility. So kind of overnight having to ensure that we could provide solutions that were compatible across mobile devices um, since, you know, students were not able to kind of access the tablets that we were selling anymore. We sell hardware along with our product as well. Um, and then primarily just transitioning to a digital funnel entirely, right? So with marketing that came with kind of overnight, like having to roll out like a free version of our app on the app store. Um, so that we could give access to free content to students and then kind of use that as a sort of digital leads funnel. Um, from sales kind of moving to a digital model, um, we had a feed on the street model up until then overnight having to kind of A-B test new digital models um, and then trying to account for reduced purchasing power as well, right? So kind of trying to figure out how to create different variants of SKUs of our products that will enable customers to purchase our products without having to break the bank in a time when there was no income for a lot of families. Okay. Um, so I think those are mean the challenges that we've been seeing. Emma, your quick thoughts. I, I, I would like to, you know, kind of move uh, the discussion a little bit away from, you know, what we have, because I feel that there's a lot of um, uh, agreement or consensus on the kind of positive or the positivities uh, that this whole situation has brought upon us, but let me let me start with uh, you know putting across a very conventional wisdom that has been there today that what uh, demonetization did for digital payments, COVID did for you know digital education. Uh, we also need to understand one thing is that while we are talking about the uh, students and the ecosystem in general we also need to understand that this has always been the case for the past one or two years we have been moving towards it uh, slowly but surely we have been moving towards more and more you know digital or online uh, you know uh, students taking online classes etc mm. the fact remains is of course covid has has increased the pace the the, the, the kind of you know uh, people coming on boarding and all that but at the same time 
i think we we have missed out two very very important uh, you know stakeholding which which was never there as part of the general ecosystem one was the teacher mm. and the second was the students which are and both of them have typical problems uh, which are like first, first of all there is a digital divide you have schools and students and teachers who are in metros who have access to all these kinds of infrastructure as well as you know digital courses and all kinds of resources available but at the same time out of 32 crore students you have 30 crore students or 28 crore students who do not have access to either the proper infrastructure like devices etc or they do not know how to have that kind of a bandwidth etc plus the teachers when we talk about the teachers as we somebody rightly said earlier mr i think mr balaji said that earlier there was no focus on the teacher she was an invisible part but today when we talk to our teachers the teachers are a very demotivated lot one because for a 4 hour class she has to prepare for an 8 hours session she she has to prepare for 8 hours to have a 4 hour session so and then there is a parent sitting in front of her in a session and then there's a lot of you know that that you know things happening and you know there's a lot of demotivation there the students are not able to properly understand so of course there needs to be a blended learning as i was probably saying in the, in the in the beginning that we will have to go back to blended learning no doubt but i think the more major thing or the major sector that will be affected by this whole thing would be probably the coaching tuition centers because as more and more people move towards online learning and online coaching these typical conventional offline coaching tuition centers definitely they'll be affected schools right. will have to be adopted but we'll have to take more of these you know middle rung or the lower middle class students and the teachers into the mainstream because that is where we have to focus because the top 10 was always there and they would have nevertheless been there but how do right. we take care of these is is a challenge that we have to all you know answer right great so we have first lovely round up you know and so many insights i want to come to you charles and ashwin you know Uh, so what we have also summed up and what we have experienced in this uh, conversation is that you know connectivity deliverability apart from having great content is critical somehow i think this is a resounding uh, thing tell me quickly how do you see uh, covid impact on uh, you know uh, edutech players so far and what needs to be done to make it more seamless i want to start with that thought charles to you yes yeah, yeah sure um one thing i want to thank everybody is it was very good learning experience to hear all these opinions around the room here let me assure you that everything everybody discussed is also happening over here in the US exactly the same things um you know what one thing that wasn't mentioned is when when this all started so quickly many many students didn't even have a mobile device or a laptop to use in some areas so you know it all kinds of problems but anyhow you're not alone <laughs> so i think uh part of the problem is this the surprise of everything you know nobody had time to prepare for this and we're lear everybody's learning as they go so we we clearly identify what works what doesn't work and what needs to happen now is a lot of maturity and and innovation in this area because one thing that we learned in our in the study results is even as we move away from the pandemic a lot of the behaviors that people have adopted are going to continue mm -hmm. maybe maybe um maybe in in uh, you know the younger students probably back to school but for colleges and universities they already were using online a lot for some of the courses so they'll continue but all the other types of usage like social interaction like working from home um people have learned to do it well and it's going to continue i know i know here a lot of discussions can we reduce the amount of office space we have because it's not necessary for everybody to come to the office mm -hmm. and uh, that and that's going to continue so i think a lot we have to get all this right because it's only going to become part of society now that more things will be online for a long long time mm -hmm. but you know there's always silver linings right we've seen like air pollution you know the air is so clear uh you've seen these videos of some cities that used to look you know like it was always fog and now you see crystal clear you can see the mountains and you know the earth is getting a break <laughs> right now and you know so i'm looking forward to you know less commuting you know more things online so it's very broad beyond just this this learning problem 
is you know just tremendous changes and watch watch the innovations that happen you know in the next year or two around this. Ashwin, you want to add to this? No, I think um, I think this was great. Um, you know, I heard a lot of good feedback, experiences from all the panelists. Um, you know, Charles kind of gave uh, you guys the the thirty thousand feet on on the impact of COVID. Um, you know, I. I'm more focused in India, so I'll, I'll just talk about India. Um, you know, here, I think I've heard a lot of pointers around connectivity. Um, one of the big challenges I think we are all experiencing is that if you look at just the, the COVID impact on the infrastructure, the telecommunication and internet infrastructure, that's taken a major hit, right? If you were accessing Prime or Netflix, you will see that they have dropped the bit rates of their videos. Mm -hmm. um, yep. They're not really sacrificing on the audio, but they're sacrificing on the video. Um, India is unique uh, to my business. The reason being that when we work with our, our ed tech education e-learning customers, um, for us, the biggest challenge is not only solve the, the user experience for students, teachers who are, who are their customers, online in the tier one cities, but how do you help solve that or give that same amount of seamless experience to audiences who are in tier two and tier three cities, right? I mean, I heard um, Gaurav or, uh, talk a little bit about that. I heard, I think Ria mentioned about connectivity issues in, in remote areas, but you know, one of the big things Limelight's trying to do, and, and it's still work in progress, is that, that we are trying to ensure that that all the students logging into the, our customers' platforms are getting a great connectivity and a great experience in, in areas and in remote areas of India. Mumbai, Delhi, West Bengal, I mean, usually have good infrastructure. The ISPs have taken a hit. I think we all know that. Even their infrastructure is limited. Um, so for us, it's, it's, it's paramount uh, that, that we are able to deliver that experience across different devices, different formats of video, um, and, and give the audiences at least uh, a bare minimum experience of, of a quality video, if not high quality. And what you can't compromise on is the hearing, the audio piece. Right. Um, if that goes, right. that's a bigger impact than the video. So that's, that's kind yeah. of what we're doing. Um, on the on the third side, and this is coming up a lot from the feedback I hear again from our customers, is infrastructure security is becoming more and more important. And when I talk about infrastructure security, is sometimes when we run a business, we often are looking at growth, right? We're not looking at slowing things down, but with growth comes challenges and loopholes in our in our security infrastructure in the cyber security infrastructure as we start enabling tech and make it as a big platform for us to launch our e-learning platforms um, you've recently heard all the news in the market about some of the security breaches um, those will just continue to happen and grow um, there are good players there are bad players like charles said they're good bots and bad bots um, it's, it's, it's critical, folks. Uh, we're in the center of all that activity and noise. Um, you all are business leaders of your business. It's, it's critical, it's absolutely important that you guys think of a security strategy while you're developing your growth strategy. Both have to go hand in hand because it's not a must have. It's not a good to have, it's a must have solution. So okay. that's, that's my two cents, yeah, right, okay. thanks. Uh, Gaurav uh, Toshinwal, I want to come to you. Uh, if you can hear me. Hey, yes, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. So I so this here is this you know uh, being a leader, a thought leader in the education space. Tell me, um, do you think we have there is a need gap? For example, e-learning edutech players, for example, edutech player is the right word. They focused on creating content, but they never thought they would also have to deal with a point where infrastructure conversation will come, you know? Uh, yeah. And we never thought the demand would surge the way it did. Do you think now the infrastructure part has come, you know, vividly a big point, something to deal with for all the content creators out there to deal with it. They have to somehow find a solution of 
putting this content across seamlessly do you think this is where it is headed now uh indeed it is i mean uh, uh, uh the whole situation has uh, uh, forced a lot of people to do a lot of uh, uh, innovative and different things uh, especially uh, 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 all of us in uh, edtech uh, mm-hmm. and that also presented a lot of uh, challenges at the same time uh, since uh, while for example we are uh, trying to launch uh, some new products but at the same time we know that uh, the infrastructure cannot take that much bandwidth to uh, give us the latencies that we uh, we would ideally want uh, so i think uh, uh, from that point of view yes the landscape is uh, uh, the infrastructure itself is uh, uh, is is going to uh, and the way the infrastructure grows is also going to play a huge role uh, uh, in that and yeah right. perfect udit the same question to you uh, how are edutech players coming to terms with this uh, you know the extra stress on infrastructure and in this webinar couple of times we had an audio thing you know it's it's like technology is because there's so much of demand on technology how do we enable this is this a concern what are you doing to address it a lot of innovations i see happening uh, from the technology standpoint i think all of us all of us have are slowly moving and adopting cdn networks uh, if we already weren't but not uh, there so i think uh, even for streaming our own videos uh, we are utilizing cdn networks uh, many of us are doing this for the very first time and right. also seeing uh, rising challenges uh, there so uh, a lot of you know i think uh, last month we had around maybe uh, 50 terabytes of data consumed on our platform mm-hmm. and uh, videos was not our primary source it was only uh, recorded videos getting watched over the network right. so right so yeah we immediately had to move to a cdn and you know so i right. think people are utilizing cdn now right better than before right uh, balaji with the same question to you uh, and when we talk about that bharat is consuming it where network issues are already there you know uh, a quick 2 minute answer to this you know uh, how important is distribution in the whole game and uh, how are you making it more you know kind of experience is more smooth seamless how are you in uh, it basically distribution is a, a huge part of this whole game there's no question about it and uh, like for example many of the places that uh, where we are working we do one is to look at uh, cities where they already know how to access uh, they come online and so on so there is really not a much of a problem in terms of people accessing things in uh, el- more elite schools uh, urban areas and so on but right. when you go to small towns when you work with villages and so on there you have to look at the fact that first only access is mobile most of them don't even have an access to a laptop or something so you have to basically make it available in a format first of all data is a big problem for many of them so right. they have very limited data connectivity so you have to look at uh, content in a way where you can give like a small video but a lot of text based content that they can use game based things which can be downloaded some of it offline some of it online so we have to develop a whole lot of technology things that for example now we have lots of kids who are in villages using our fraction scores our english math content etc and uh, most of it is like little bit of online a very small percentage that they would use online a large part of it is downloaded onto their phone so they can use it offline so you will need to do that kind of a combination to ensure that uh, where connectivity is an issue and it is going to be a big issue sometimes it's not just connectivity data costs are important so therefore for many of these places you will need to look at uh, particularly if you're talking about bharat and you're talking about rural areas definitely there is going to be a huge issue of uh, pricing price point data cost all of that is going to play a big role in terms of access uh, we are now working for example with a lot of the rural schools and very clearly live classes do not work there i mean i uh, i know that live classes make a difference uh, when you're looking at uh, urban areas we offer uh, we have been doing that for several years now and we know that that has a definite advantage in certain contexts but uh, when you go to places where the bandwidth is really low it is very irritating for the child also to use live classes so there shifting sometimes not even fully video 
part video, part uh, uh, because the buffering will be too much. So you'll have to use part video and you have to use a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, game text-based content, something that can be done on a phone or a app sure. kind of thing makes a big difference. So. Perfect, perfect. I'm sorry, I'm just quickly going through this two minutes to each panelist because we want to cover as much as possible. Uh, um, uh, Poonam, I want to come to you with the same thought. Uh, has, is distribution the big conversation for ad tech players? Uh, it is, and it has been uh, from the very early stage for us. We realized that connectivity is an issue in the country. Even in the urban areas, it is not fantastic. And, and when we bring... Uh, uh, learning content, it is rich media. So for that experience, we, we created a solution which was offline. Uh, the SD card driven embedded in the tablets and that is available in the rural area or a far off area. We deliver our solutions even on a tab. Though finally we feel the real penetration is on the cellular device because having an app was very critical. And we also, uh, we have everything online, but we have made it on the app and also in an offline format. And, right. and I think that one thought I want to leave you with, that COVID has pushed even fence sitters online. And finally, when we get offline again and we think the world is normal, what will be a blended model, but what will require for the ethics companies and the users to have agility of response from right. moving seamlessly from off to on and as per their requirement and optimization. From this will come new economic models in the business for the schools also and institutions where right now they're going with 4,000 students because they have 4,000 uh, classrooms. Now they might hit the 10,000 and 15,000. Perfect. By a blended model. So this was perfect. also another perfect. Thing. Perfect. Thank Arjun, you. Arjun, your thoughts, your quick thoughts on this, uh, you know. Uh, if you can hear me, Arjun. Uh, okay, I, I'll go to uh, Amar. I'll come to you quickly. Your thoughts on this. Amar, I, I, I think I totally agree with what Mr. Balaji and Poonam Singh said, that we, we have to move towards what we call as an offline come online model where if you have to cover more and more of these rural and uh, you know that part of the digital divide have nots. I think we will, we, we are also doing the same thing because if you also see that schools have always been looking for an offline content. They have never looked for any online content because they know that there's no network or infrastructure out there. So right. even for the students, more and more students to come in, we have to create more and more offline content so that, you know, ease of access and, and economies of, you know, kind of costing and all that. It, helps them in terms of converting on this or covering on this. Uh, Ria, your thoughts on this? Hi. Uh, yeah, so I think, um, you know, I, I think, I think Balaji mentioned this. Um, we do a lot of the same things where we have reduced reliance on video content, additional reliance on um, written content activities and stuff in the, in the classroom. Um, the challenge for us is uh, providing offline content in a classroom and in a virtual classroom environment. So uh, I think, you know, it's definitely more of a blended approach for us as well, heavier on the online, which is some of the sort of bigger challenges that we faced with people in uh, tier two and tier, tier three cities as well. So well, some of the things that we've accomplished within our virtual classroom is, you know, throttling of video um, so that we automatically reduce video quality when we detect uh, bad network, alerting students and teachers both in the classroom when we detect poor network, um, enforcing certain amount of uh, certain network quality in the tech check uh, prior to class before even allowing students to enter a class. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, in the virtual classroom, always prioritizing audio over a video. Um, so, you know, when you kind of reach a point where video quality is like low and is too low to continue, um, we try to allow the audio feed to continue at least. Perfect. Karanveer, uh, tell me about this magic of seamlessness. How, how, how is this happening, you know, and at your end? Sorry, your audio is muted. I think Balaji and Poonam, they have summed it well. Uh, that it has to be a mix of online and offline, a blended model, especially for Bharat, because connectivity there is is much worse than what we experience here in the urban area. Uh, what I wish to bring uh, to attention of companies like uh, you know companies that Charles uh, is leading is that there has to be a very separate 
very dedicated and a very uh, different solution for the rural market. Um, one of the mistakes that we end up making is that probably we think India as one market, but when you start going deep, you realize that each state, uh, each state is a very, very different market. Um, so the solution that you build, that you start building for India may not work for Bharat. Bharat is the rural part of our country. So for, for that, you'll have to have a very different kind of solution. Uh, I don't know uh, if, uh, if your organization today has some solution that can cater to that, uh, that market. Second is uh, slightly off the track, but uh, I think a, a relevant point here, the quality of teachers and the quality of education in India is going to improve. Mm -hmm. Because till yesterday, there was no limelight on the tutors. They could teach whatever they, they would want. But now because you know there are, there are watchful eyes watching them all the time, so the quality of education will improve. Uh, long-term impact of COVID, long-term positive impact of COVID uh, will slowly, slowly uh, die down on K-12, but it will stay relevant for the coaching institutes because schools will again open and you know teachers uh, and, and students will be back in uh, in the physical environment right. but coaching institutes and the rural uh, the scope that remains there and I think I, think I agree with uh, both Udit and uh, um, Kulkit that you know education I believe teaching especially is an art right uh, you cannot replace teacher out of the system Right. Uh, I still remember there used to be some days when we used to party whole night, but still would attend the next day's lecture because the teacher would create that spell in the class. You know? mm -hmm. So a pure play video uh, might not be able to create that uh, impact. So you have to have live streaming classes and for live streaming classes, you'll have require a very different kind of solution. Right. Uh, Kush, uh, are you here? Uh, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll come to you, Prajwal, your, your thoughts on this. Hello. Okay, I think th there is. I think connectivity is actually very, very important. Distribution is very important. That is a resounding <laughs> thing. Uh, uh, Gaurav, uh, if I can ask you the same question, uh, how to, how to, I mean, how, how to meet this, uh, how to break this gap between great content and making it available to the other side. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, as all of uh, us are mentioning about the need of right tech also in place, like. If you look at, we have taken a slightly different approach uh, mm. because we knew that there was a connectivity issue. So uh, all our live class, so we built our own tech for streaming the live classes. We don't use CDN for that. And we've been able to stream a live class for about 256 kbps. Mm. So we don't face now much of the challenge in terms of streaming a live class. Step two, once a class is done, that goes recorded and that gets delivered through a CDN network. Right, right. Now, this is about the uh, just a delivery part of it so that everybody has an access to the content. And again, second part is about the customer success. Now, how will this candidate will become uh, successful? Okay, right. so uh, at that side, I think the, it has to do a lot with how you structure your entire class. How do you, how does your curriculum follow? You have a live class, then you have an assessment. Are you tracking those? So we have small WhatsApp groups between, suppose there's five, like we have classes as large as, I don't know, you laugh, but as large as 3000 students. Okay. So now how do you manage those students in a single classroom? Okay. And we are talking about 40, 50 students cannot be managed. You cannot give them personalized attention. So how do you do it at that kind of a scale? So we've created small groups. We've been talking to them. As I earlier mentioned, again, there's a secondary teacher who is working with them. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of uh, discussion forums which has been created for them. They are coming asking how. At our side, we are doing a lot of follow-ups with respect to their assessment scores. So, so we feel a lot, much, a lot more personalized touch, which is largely around taking that danda, kivos, you're not there in the class, uh, why your scores are still not improving, tell us what we can do for you. I think we have taken a pretty traditional approach, uh, like because we work with coaching centers. So like we learned from them that let's take this approach, figure out what has to be automated and just don't run for an automation. And I think this is something which has really worked well. Perfect. Uh, Prajul, if I can come to you, if you can hear me, the same thoughts, you know, of creating uh... Uh, a great experience for end users, you know, how do we enable this given that technology is stressed, you know, distribution networks are overloaded. How are you, what are you doing in that way, you know, to address this problem? Uh, the thing is, um, 
most of the videos you know uh, the problem comes when you are uh, delivering the video um, um, uh, any lecture live right that's when uh, the problem happens that in between if uh, the connection drops um, we just faced it with punam right now right we were uh, you know, in a conversation and this happened this can happen everywhere and then students might get, get stressed a lot so right. it's all about you know having the video session first live session and you know uh, have a recorded session after that and then a doubt clearing session uh, you know as a follow up session uh, for the students so mm. that that uh, would be actually uh, quite good and again uh, it's uh, all about the network that we have if we are able to compress our videos in such a way that it doesn't use a lot of bandwidth and there's no lag uh, this works a lot and obviously uh, a good cdn would help us you know at least in india uh, you know there are certain points i think uh, uh, if if you have you know the servers close to uh, the users it should, it should uh, work fine so most of uh, uh, um, now now we have a social network for college students so what we are trying to do is we are trying to provide uh, you know technical videos there and, and we have worked in the past with other large coaching institutes also so that's a these are the things that we have faced you know when people are in their home right not everybody is in their uh, you know in their colleges uh, nowadays so, uh, they are in their hometown and their network is very slow so that's where the problems arise and and uh, Right. Yeah. Right. Also, encryption of the videos and security of videos is also a very important aspect. Where you know, uh, most of us have a video contents available, and um, the thing is, students try to tend to record those sessions and then you know, leak it out. I think uh, this would uh, some some of those people, for example, other two person might have faced these things where you know, people record videos and then and they share it on Google Drive. Right. We have to come up with a mechanism to uh, restrict that also. You know, provide our, our dynamic watermarking system. Uh, and unable to download right the encrypted videos so those are things that sure. everybody needs and nowadays sure. sure anuj your thoughts and then i come to pulkit after that yeah so i think uh, technology can solve these problems and i think this is this is very important to uh, actually invest into the right technologies and right architecture so as as we mentioned that uh, how to use the uh, cdn effectively and then how to actually make use of the right set of technologies which you are using in your app or in your websites that that is important right mm -hmm. these these things cannot be done in like in a, in a like day or two right when you actually think about a product creation then you always think about you have to think about all these things so i think right set of strategies in terms of technical architecture uh, using right cdns and uh, right tools to build kind of your product and using less data when you are actually Uh, streaming the content to the user and i think giving them the uh, fall back of let's suppose if let's suppose there is a, a drop in the network then how you are actually uh, solving the problem of the student by giving him a recorded video as soon as possible so these these things actually uh, kind of solve this problem and i think tech could give a better solution in terms of giving a distribution to these kind of areas where where we have a network connectivity issues so tech is the important part here so right set of technologies needs to be used to actually get this done uh pulkit your thoughts yeah so i have slightly different thoughts there so uh, way back in 2014 when we started live we started by building our own infrastructure and everything um later on i realized that you know there are multiple problems to solve uh and i think a lot of things will converge as we go ahead so uh i would love to take in fact what we are doing is we are taking root of relying on the experts like limelight in the field because they know this side of the technology much better to you know solve the problem of uh, connectivity you know providing solution at a very low bandwidth though we are doing our bit as well to fine tune it mm -hmm. but what we i want to work more towards is you know um, the other side of the problem which the group talked about earlier how can we create predictable learning experiences academic learning experiences for the kids how can we provide you know better content as uh, punam was talking about how can we uh, personalize the learning journeys for each and every kid and other side of the problems are being taken care by you know the companies like limelight to the players like jio to the government push so on one side the connectivity problems will keep getting solved on the other side you know uh, my thought is to you know solve the other side of the problem and right. i think the things will converge right. so that's my take on the okay. the thing uh gorav toshnal i mean i started with you but would you like to add something to it you know before i go to charles and uh, ashwin uh, nothing particular i think it's 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 the marriage of uh, product and technology at the end of the day uh, uh like whatever the constraints are there uh, 
in terms of technology product has to uh, uh, work around that uh, i mean constraints could be anywhere uh, on any level uh, be it uh, cdn be it uh, uh, the costs be it the network bandwidth be it the network operator anywhere so uh, i think uh, uh, i mean in general i think uh, the infrastructure is or uh, uh, technology is not as big a uh, bottleneck i think because uh, we have sufficient uh, amount of uh, solutions and technologies which are uh, good to stream a live class or uh, a video on demand at uh, 2g 3g speeds uh, as well so uh, yeah i think it's it's uh, it's it's a question of uh, what uh, uh, what sort of uh, spending are you ready to do on uh, something and how much benefit a consumer or a user gets from that right so it finally comes to you charles and ashwin i mean you guys have to say what is the solution to this i mean how do we enable this distribution i mean now we have seen content everybody has now they have this real issue the other day i was watching a video Uh, and the network network was so bad you know they were just showing the news that it was looking like the teacher is speaking in chinese she was speaking in hindi so it's a major concern what are the solutions what is limelight doing here to help all the tech players i yeah, just want so, to yeah sure sure so since i since i know this very well uh the data is clear that once the pandemic abates the the the, the traffic isn't going down right it's just going to it's going to be maybe a little bit but it's going to be continuing growth we know we have to just keep on adding to capacity we have to keep innovating in technologies you know we've done things like try to optimize for poor connections with different tcp stacks you know always you know you sacrifice video to make sure the audio stays solid and we we just know we have to keep growing as fast as we can everywhere it's not just you know india is a particular hot spot right uh, there's others in the world we just have to we have to keep adding you know and uh we're doing it you know we have we have the plans and we have the support of the board to you know keep just keep expanding you know it doesn't stop and keep innovating on protocols and so forth to you know solve these connectivity problems in rural areas you know so if i want you know i one comment i want to make as we're using this to, as we're talking about this we see these issues with zoom and you know it's the same problem we all have you know in december zoom was sort of a startup and december zoom had 10 million users today they have 300 million users that's that's pretty incredible that they were able to do it even this well in that short period of time because it and, and it was very quick it was sort of in february 10 or 20 million users and then within weeks it went over 100 million and then another few weeks to 300 million that the fact that they could even do that at all is pretty amazing to me and they'll you know they'll improve you know but it's 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 interesting using these same tools so technology you know technology can solve a lot of problems we just keep investing and keep doing it yeah great ashwin to you final words no i think there's lot being said you know my my job today was to just kind of quietly hear into all the feedback coming from our esteemed panelists um i try to take the pain behind the statements which have the pain behind the scenes of everyone's business uh, as a sales guy that's kind of what i work on understanding the real challenges um my my message to everyone is you know there's lots of technology out there that's not like like um what you guys are good at is you understand your education business don't get your hands too dirty with technology there are experts out there who are focused on solving those problems for you so have some faith and trust on them and they'll solve it keep growing and scaling your business and and let the rest do the rest um on from an india perspective you know uh, we we are focusing big time on tier 2 and tier 3 cities for our e learning customers um tier 1 of course tier 1 but tier 2 and tier 3 cities is my mandate how do we give our customers customers great user experience across different devices different networks in smaller towns because that's the growth that's the scale and then we see also gaming coming in as a big factor in in terms of user interactions how you keep your users engaged online you know that's becoming a part of the teaching paradigm um 
security I already mentioned. So yeah, I mean, I think this has been a great experience for me as well. We we talk to a lot of business folks in my in my line of business, right? It's for a change. It's good to meet the e-learning and the education space in sort of the OTT and the broadcasting space. That's a different set of challenges. Um, so I appreciate everyone giving us the opportunity and coming and letting us present our products as well. So thank you all. Thank you so much for these wonderful views. Uh, I thank you all for your time. It has been a great discussion and it merits another discussion, of course. And I have so many questions on my WhatsApp that I'm sorry we're out of time and over time. Maybe next time I can uh, so pose much. those questions. We are thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We uh, really appreciate your time, giving us your time, and see you soon. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Yeah, stay safe. Bye bye. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you so much.